My name is David Pascucci and I was working at the Perceptual Networks Group of Heist Plomb and I'm now at the APFL in Lausanne. And it's my pleasure to take over from the last talk and uh, going a bit more into details uh, after the excellent introduction you had about uh, dynamic and direct connectivity and the Granger causality framework. I will then spend some time in uh, discussing the structure and function relationship and presenting a way to combine information from the structure and the function in order to achieve a more uh, biologically plausible measure of dynamic connectivity. So the brain is a very complex system with billions of neurons and trillions of connections. And these units interact constantly and directly. And we often rely on a measurement that uh, suffer from either low spatial or low temporal resolution and are highly affected by noise with the aim to characterize dynamics in this system that are distributed and very fast, which means that if you take the activity in three regions of the brain, for example, there is a myriad of way in which this activity can be uh, the, in which there may be statistical dependencies in time from no dependence at all. So three signals that are completely autonomous to any sort of uh, uh, synchronous and lagged interaction. How fast are these dynamics? Where uh, as Hayes mentioned before, they are extremely fast. Just imagine the time it takes for you to recognize the content or the meaning of an image. This seems trivial to us, but it's something that requires very fast exchange of information, feed forward and feedback among regions of the brain that are very distant. And this is all a matter of milliseconds. So as introduced before, one way to characterize these uh, temporal dependencies in a statistical sense among different signals is the Wiener Granger causality framework. And if we focus again on this uh, three example of three, uh, the activity in three regions of the brain, for we, let's say that we can take a segment of it. And the building block of this definition of causality can be seen uh, through the autoregressive model. An autoregressive model, the, the aim is to uh, see whether the value of a time series at certain time points, so of this x1 at time t, can be predicted, can be explained by taking into account uh, the value of the same time series uh, at certain time points in the past. And this has a, an intuitive and simple uh, mathematical definition, which basically we try to model the signal at time t as a linear combination of previous values of the signal, t minus one, minus two, weighted by this linear coefficient, which is called an autoregressive coefficient. And this can be expressed in more compact form as the signal now is a weighted combination, linear combination of the signal uh, before up to some lag in the past with this autoregressive coefficients. Of course, we can do much with only one signal. And when we have more than one, we can define an autoregressive system where the same equation holds for different signal. But the most interesting part is that is when we try to explain whether, uh, we try to find out whether the values of the present of this time series, the first one, can be also explained by taking into account the past of another, of a second time series, x2, and whether this additional information explained the data better than the past of the uh, first time series alone. And this is the main concept behind Granger causality, which is uh, expressed by this extended equation where you model x1 at time t as a weighted combination of its own past with this uh, autoregressive coefficients and a way, uh, plus uh, the past of the other time series. And then the ratio of variance between this extended model and the, the reduced one is what defines the, the uh, classical Granger causality measure. 
So what we what will be useful for this talk is to focus on this matrix of autoregressive coefficient. This matrix is I keep with the example of three nodes, and this matrix contains uh, all the linear coefficients that can um, that can be zero or non-zero, and express the influence of uh, the own, its own past of one time series or other time series in modeling the present. And this can be easily visualized in this way. So considering this matrix where you have the uh, influence of X1 on itself at lag one, so one time point in the past, or the influence of X1 on X3 and all the possible combination. And of course you can have more than one lag. And that's uh, another important aspect that maybe decide based on, the sev there are several ways to choose the uh, number of lags. Most of them are based on information criteria. But the point here is that uh, this seems to be a nice way to describe uh, functional interaction between different signals. But if we assume that this is something that can be estimated only once, this is something that is the same across time, then we can be completely wrong. Because as we know, the uh, brain activity changes in time. Uh, it's it's, it's non-stationary by nature. And this means that also the, underlay, the underlying uh, autoregressive coefficients changes. So they can visit different states that change rapidly in time. And to have a measure of dynamic connectivity, we should be able to track these changes. How do we do that? Well, one way could be to use uh, segments, so short uh, sliding windows, and to compute the Granger causality on these windows, and then you move to another windows and, and you and so on and so forth, which gives you uh, a relatively good ability to track any potential changes in this uh, functional connectivity. But of course, if you if the sliding window, there is always a compromise because the shorter the window, the less data you have, and the, the model estimation will be uh, worse. On the other side, if we look, if we use uh, long sliding windows, we may end up uh, averaging out important changes that are too short uh, to be detected. So we can have good estimate, but poor tracking ability of this uh, method. What could be the best way? The best way could be to have a model, to have an algorithm that can help us to uh, have uh, reliable estimates of these autoregressive coefficients, but also an eye uh, precision of tracking in time. And this is the promise of adaptive filters that you will see more in details later and in the tutorial today. Adaptive filters uh, are supposed to in, uh, estimate ma these matrices of autoregressive coefficients at each time point with a relatively good ability uh, to model them and of course a really uh, fast estimates of changes which ultimately can be very useful if we want to go into the frequency domain as high as, uh, as shown before uh, we can uh, derive frequency representation of Granger causality and if we can base this representation on single autoregressive uh, coefficient matrices of autoregressive coefficients if we have many of them, we can end up with something very nice, like a time frequency representation of uh, functional connectivity, directed connectivity. In this case, uh, you would interpret this as the contribution from uh, signal X1 to X2 uh, at different frequencies and different time points with the resolution of uh, uh, hertz and milliseconds. So adaptive filters, uh, one of the most known adaptive filters is the Kalman filter, which is uh, something that you probably also have uh, an algorithm that you have probably in your phone or in any tracking system. And is one of the best way to track, filter and predict time varying signals. The uh, idea behind this filter is that, let's take the example of two time series X1 and X2. So the Kalman filter starts making a prediction of their state, which is a B-dimensional, meaning that it takes into account the average, the, the potential estimate of the value with the uncertainty around it. And then it makes a prediction. 
And this prediction is often based on uh, knowledge about the transitional rules. So how this signal as it, uh, are expected to change. And then we take a measurement from the real data. So we take an observation and we com combine the measurement and the prediction in an optimal way, meaning that based on the, the relative uncertainty. And this gives us the new state. So the estimate of the state. And this is one cycle of this recursion. And this is done for every time point. Now, when it comes to EEG signal, this is not so straightforward. This is not trivial at all. First, because we have no knowledge about this transition. So what are the rules that govern a change between the EEG activity at one time point and the next? And we also uh, have no idea in principle, or we can only approximate all these variances, this measurement uncertainty noise and noise of the prediction, because we have no knowledge about this. So one way to uh, approximate, to use the Kalman filter in the context of EEG signals is to assume that, so to start with the prediction, uh, we, to start with some estimate of, of the outer aggressive coefficients. And then the prediction is that they will remain the same. So an identity. We predict that the uh, outer aggressive coefficient in the second time point will be the same. Then we take our measurement from the data that we have that we recorded. And we use these, the residuals from the, the prediction to update the autoregressive coefficients. And this clearly requires one, uh, at least one parameter that determines how fast we are going to do this update. Depen and this is, can be seen as how much do we want to trust the measurement uh, compared to uh, the prediction that we made. This seems rather tricky. So we did some simulation to uh, check how uh, easy it is to uh, use this Kalman filter in, uh, in the domain of EEG signal, and also to understand how, uh, what is the risk of choosing a wrong uh, adaptation constant. So the, this parameter that determines the speed of update. We simulate, uh, we develop basically a simulation framework that really uh, simulate uh, EEG-like data with different, regulated by different uh, uh, matrices of autoregressive coefficients. So we create them, meaning that we know what the ground truth is in this case. And we tested the ability of the Kalman filter to reproduce this uh, imposed uh, structure or in the functional connectivity in the data. And of course, so if you use an algorithm that uh, trusts too much the measurements, then you will end up updating these matrices of autoregressive coefficients any, at any time point. And in the end, you have a, a highly variable estimates that if you use the frequency representation will result in uh, systematic spikes and sudden changes in the estimate. So this is not something that we would like to have. On the other hand, if we tend to give more weight, so to trust more our predictions instead of the measurement, the filter may be too slow, meaning that it may get stuck with some initial residuals and may not be able to capture changes, uh, dynamic changes at all, which is also something that is not so in this, within this project, uh, this synergy project, we develop one new filter. And this is what you will see in detail today with Maria and Yolan uh, tutorial, which is called, we call the self-tuning optimized Kalman filter or stock, which basically, uh, I go to the core uh, definition of the filter. You can find the details in our publication. But basically, it has, um, we uh, find um, implemented a way to make the filter self-tuning, meaning that it has a um, self-tuning memory that constantly adapts to the data in a kind of optimal way. And this is all based on a simple equation in which the future state, the, the update of the state, so the uh, matrix of autoregressive coefficients, is a combination of the prediction of the previous state plus uh, uh, this is a least square solution. So a matrix of uh, autoregressive coefficients obtained by regressing the past of all the time series onto the present. So this is a 
ordinary least square of the previous values of the signals on the present ones, which ultimately goes down to this simple equation. And I have to put it this here because it's gonna be useful later uh, during the talk. So this filter, as you can see, was actually able to track these changes in the frequency and time that we impose in our simulation, clearly better than an <clears throat> Kalman filter with a, with the wrong parameter. So we tested this algorithm in a, a benchmark of uh, epicranial recordings in RAT that you can also find online. And it's a, it's a useful benchmark data set to have for testing connectivity data because uh, we, we know what happens in this particular, uh, we have clear expectation about the functional connectivity in this data. So this is a, um, rec these are recordings taken during a whisker stimulation. And we know that the first uh, region that is activated is the contralateral somatosensory cortex. And then the signal propagates rapidly to the two nearest regions in the somatory and uh, uh, in, in the near uh, space, which are represent, these are the location of the electrodes that were recorded. And basically uh, we would expect uh, something that follows the dynamic of the ERP that are recorded, a very first peak of activity in E4, and then uh, the other two nodes that are actually, where activity is actually driven by this one. And when we compare the uh, performance of the Kalman filter with this new filter, uh, we found clearly several problems with the Kalman filter that seems to be unable to track at all anything that resemble these expected dynamics. Whereas the stock filter actually uh, produced something that was at least physiologically plausible in the sense that there was this strong peak of uh, network activity from the expected somatosensor, contralateral somatosensory cortex. And the two main receivers of this activity well, uh, were uh, clearly detected as the E2 and E6 node. And this also was not just uh, an overall uh, influence, but with clear dynamics that increases at uh, time points of evoked activity. We also tested this in human data in a task in EG recordings during a task in which participants were asked to, uh, were presented with a cloud of moving dots and they had to uh, decide whether the, there was coherent or random motion in the, in the clouds. This typically gives uh, if the, the classical pattern of ERP components and our set, the main, this is, self-tuning uh, parameter of our model that clearly changes in a way that seems to track the intrinsic dynamics of the signal. When we look at the um, time frequency connectivity that uh, we um, were able to estimate with the Kalman and with the stock, that there were clear non-negligible differences. So here you have the overall patterns of connectivity. So considering a network of 20 regions in the brain, uh, this is the overall pattern of connectivity. You have the frequency and time. This is with the Kalman and you see that the Kalman can capture this uh, well-known desynchronization uh, of alpha activity after stimulation. Uh, but it does in a way that is not so frequency specific, meaning that we cannot clearly see a peak in the alpha, something that we can see when we look at the frequency resolution of the stock filter. And also this uh, stock filter was also able to, to provide richer uh, dynamics in the sense that there were uh, detected an increase of gamma activity, which can be related to motion processing and was not visible in the Kalman with dynamics in time domain that are way more um, rich than the Kalman itself. So to conclude this first part, time varying functional connectivity uh, faces several problems, including the challenge of modeling uh, signals that changes constantly, so non-stationary. We are also affected by unknown uh, sources of noise and optimize adaptive filters seems to overcome these issues and maybe promising tools for the estimation of time varying 
multivariate autoregressive model with high temporal precision, basically the temporal precision of your sampling rate in a way. And this can be very useful, uh, for example, when we want to model connectivity changes, functional connectivity changes during uh, event-related activity, as the one that you would record in a task about perception, connection, and action. Now, I'd like to uh, introduce you uh, one of the common problems that we can find in this, uh, with this approach. Let's go back to our three uh, signals. And let's say that we, there is a particular type of interaction between this signal by which X1 uh, influences X3 after one time point and X2 after two time points. In terms of autoregressive coefficients, this will be represented in this way. So there will be a non-zero coefficient from x1 to x3 at the first lag, and a non-zero coefficient from x1 to x2 at the second lag. Now, let's say that for some reason, we didn't measure x1. So we have no recordings about x1. And we only want to look at the functional connectivity between x2 and x3. Now, because of this, uh, I would say, hidden interaction that we cannot see directly because we are not measuring this signal, we are not including this in the model, we will end up finding that there is a non-zero coefficient from x3 to x2 at the first lag due to this indirect uh, connection. There is not much we can do in this case, because if we haven't measured one uh, hidden, so this is the problem of the third unknown. If we have no information about this um, additional signal, we cannot do much. What we can do, however, is to use some prior information. So if we have prior information about the expected connections between these regions, uh, we, we can use it to avoid or to counteract some potential issue like this. So for example, let's say that we know in advance that there is no, there should be no connectivity between X2 and X3. And let's say that we manage to uh, use a model. So to start with prior information about this that we can use in this estimate. And let's say that we can use it in a particular way in which we create this, uh, what I call this structural priors, in which we say that we expect the connectivity to be zero for, for, from, for each one of these potential connections. But then we use this prior information to decide how much we trust this initial belief that there is no connectivity. I will go into details later, but the point is that something like this can be easily incorporated in the uh, ordinary least square equation that I showed you before, which is the one that is used in our algorithm to uh, estimate autoregressive coefficients at each time point. We can in incorporate this information in the form of a generalized Deacon of regularization term. You can find the details in uh, one of our recent papers. And what happens in this way is that for example, when we model X2, we will start from our prior belief that there is no zero con functional connectivity from its own past and zero functional connectivity from the past of X3. But our uncertainty about this expectation of zero is quite large for X2, meaning that we are really not sure that there is zero connectivity and therefore we will trust everything the data tell us. But in this case, the variance of the prior is narrow. So we are rather sure that there should be no connectivity from X3 to X2, which means that we will uh, tend to rely more on this expectation than on whatever is in the data, ending up with a model that at least in this case solves the problem of the third unknown. And this is only one potential reason why starting with some prior information about the structure of functional connections can be useful. 
what is a structural prior? So structural priors can be uh, derived from prior stood from existing literature or meta-analysis data, can be functional connectivity from another modality, but can also be what is seems to be more uh, appropriate. Uh, measure derived from structural connectivity from, for example, from diffusion tensor imaging. And this is because in principle, structural connectivity provides the backbone, the topological space for functional connectivity. And combining the two goes really uh, in the direction of a more uh, biological and physiologically plausible model of functional connectivity. But of course, this relationship is not one-to-one -one and is not uh, always straight because this relationship can vary a lot. And plus, the, the, there is a vast repertoire of dynamic neur neuronal interactions and there, are, there is a myriad of anatomical possibilities. So it's not uh, a, a type of structural information that should determine completely the functional connectivity that we estimate. One way that we use and that is often used when one wants to combine structural information with functional connectivity is to uh, use structural connectivity graphs, which are, are often uh, undirected adjust, adjacency matrices that can be either binary determining the presence or absence of a physical link, or weighted, for example, giving a measure of the strength, the base on the number of fibers, for instance. And there is already work showing that if you use this type of prior information, you have uh, an increase in the model evidence in, uh, in, the, in the different domain of uh, dynamic uh, causal modeling in effective connectivity. And also the typically, uh, Structural connectivity priors can help to reduce false positive in functional connectivity. But again, there is no one to one correspondence. You often can have functional connectivity in the absence of structural connectivity. And also, structural connectivity itself is not the most reliable prior because it has uh, suffers, for example, from a substantial number of false positives. So, the best way would be to combine these two, uh, let's say, information that are uh, that have their own uncertainty and problems in an optimal way, in a way that uh, combines the, uh, when we are very sure about structural information, we trust less the data, but when we are not so sure, we uh, try to trust more the functional uh, part of the data. And this is what we try to do in the next uh, step. So in this um, modified version of the stock algorithm, which I call the structural inform self-tuning optimized Kalman filter, in which basically we use these uh, multivariate autoregressive models in which, as I told you before, uh, you use this ordinary list. You start with this ordinary least square regression in which you derive the matrix of autoregressive coefficients at several lags by regressing the past of the time series, the, the signals on the present. And in this ordinary least square equation, we introduce these uh, structural priors. They are derived from uh, structural connectivity matrices. And in, basically, we use uh, the structural connection from uh, that, that enters each node to model the functional connectivity that this node should receive from the rest of the network. In, in using these priors in a way that uh, it's similar to have penalties or constraints. So we convert them into prior variants, as I showed you before, and we include them in this as a regularization term in this equation, leading to an estimate of the autoregressive coefficients, which is informed by structural connectivity. We test this again in the benchmark uh, data set of uh, epicranial recordings in red that you have seen. And actually uh, we use in this case, um, a meta-analysis of existing studies. So histologically defined axonal connections between these regions 
as our prior, as, as our structural prior. And uh, the, the matrix of priors that we started with, so here I'm showing you the expected in, inflow, so the input from E4 to all the other nodes without the prior, so this is this, uh, the field boxes, or with priors, the empty boxes. The priors that we started with were rather uh, not so different, meaning that there was an expected connectivity more or less among all the nodes. And indeed, there are no obvious changes in the functional connectivity estimates. But for the, the uh, sake of an example, we try to threshold this connectivity matrix, retaining, for example, only the 25 strongest uh, connections, 25% of strongest connections. And in this case, you can clearly see that there are changes. For example, this is a particular example because we expect functional connectivity in this case, which would be there without the prior. And even if the prior tells that there is no connectivity at all, there is still a significant connectivity because the data are telling us that there, there should be something. So this is an example of the fact that even if we use a structural prior that does, is not really in agreement with the function, we are not simply masking the functional connectivity, but we can still detect what is there in the data, although it, it's reduced. And then we did some tests in, um, by adding noise to this data just to show briefly that basically uh, the inclusion of structural priors increase the consistency of the network or the functional network that you would estimate as, the no as you increase the noise in the data. And the, uh, in a similar way, it also increases the ability to detect this expected main driver uh, even if we are perturbing the data with additional noise. So overall, of course, if you impose a structure uh, as a prior information, the estimates of functional connectivity would be more consistent across uh, noise, perturbations, and other manipulations. Finally, we test this in human data as well. This is a task where participants were presented with faces or uh, scramble images and they had to simply detect whether there was a face or not and in this task you typically end up having a ERP uh, well known as the N170 that is related always to face process mostly to face processing and in source space this gives uh, a source that is located in the fusiform mostly in the right fusiform region. So just to show you an example, the inclusion of structural priors in the estimate of functional connectivity derived from the autoregressive coefficients, uh, it's, it's cleaning up a bit the functional connectivity matrices and it gives, it's, it's like the functional connectivity inherits the structure, but not the intensity of value. So it retains also its own um, intensity of connection and Therefore, it's a combination of the two rather than a simple masking or, or a strong constraining. What we uh, were interested here was to look at whether once we use these structural priors in the context of dynamic connectivity, besides the shape of the structure of the connectivity matrix, is there something that changes also in terms of dynamics? And the results uh, seems to suggest that there is because we uh, focus on a small subset of this uh, network of 68 regions. Uh, we focus on a subset of regions that are usually involved in phase processing and we look at whether the, there is some uh, difference in response, uh, in phase selective responses, connections uh, using the prior or not. And it seems that at least there is a, uh, some, some of these dynamics are emphasized, for example, from the, the driving of activity from the fusiform to, to the inferior temporal cortex. And of course, in where there, there are weak connections that maybe may result significant, but there is no structural prior. Uh, the, the structural priors tell us that there is no connectivity. This uh, is, is wiped out. So there is no longer this, that potentially is a false positives. And also in terms of dynamics, it seems to clean also uh, um, 
dynamics that may not be entirely plausible, something that occurs before uh, 50 milliseconds and so on. So in general, this is not like um, to have any interpretation of phase processing, but it's just to show that adding structural information uh, refines the model in a way that can also change the dynamics that you estimate. So to conclude, uh, basically dynamic and directed conductivity based on adaptive filtering can help to characterize large scale rhythmic interactions uh, at, at the time scale of, at the sub-second time scale of perception and cognition, which is the uh, general aim that was introduced by Heiss in the previous talk. Also, this method uh, can incorporate information from other um, modalities, including structural progress from DTI, as you have seen uh, several lectures about this yesterday. And this is a kind of a really promising tool for the multimodal approach to uh, neuroimaging. And we presented this algorithm, which is a first attempt to have a high temporal resolution measure of directed connectivity that is optimized for uh, tracking uh, event-related changes in dynamic functional connectivity. And with this, I conclude.